Hello and welcome back to the Art of the Matter and to the fourth week of Advent. Last week, we looked at how Italian artists of the Renaissance treated the theme of the Annunciation, and this week I promised that we would take a look at how painters of the Northern School, artists who were from present-day Belgium and Holland, treated the same subject. Just to refresh your memories, we looked at artists such as Botticelli, Leonardo, and Piero della Francesco, who all sought to capture the extraordinary mystery and paradox of this moment when Gabriel tells Mary that she has been chosen to bear the Son of God if she is willing to accept God's proposal of entering her body through the Holy Spirit and creating within her the child who will become Jesus Christ. Everything turns on her decision, and we observe that Italian artists discerned four successive stages in Mary's response to Gabriel's message. First, fear and agitation, then reflection, followed by interrogation, and finally, an expression of acceptance. Each phase was distinguished by a code of gestures that Mary is observed to be making in her response to Gabriel. Artists in Italy had just begun discovering the possibilities of linear or mathematical perspective, and they used this device to convey the paradoxical idea of a finite, mortal human being containing the infinite, immortal life and power of God. Botticelli's perspective lines led the eye to focus on the suspended space between the hand of Mary and the hand of Gabriel, summing up in that tension all the potential and significance of that moment. Piero used the same device of linear perspective to convey the idea of Mary's acceptance, as an almost infinite series of arches at last gives way to a plaque of misty marble, thus putting a stop to the many centuries of longing for the Messiah, who will now begin to be formed in her womb. So, through the carefuling, careful ordering of space, Italian artists found a way to express the tension and possibility of this pivotal encounter of time and eternity. Artists of the Northern School chose a different way to accomplish this. Rather than emphasizing spatial relationships, the painters of the Netherlands used the power of the newly perfected medium of oil paint to emphasize a seemingly infinite number of precise details and symbols, giving the viewer what might be considered a God's eye view of the Annunciation, where everything is seen and everything has meaning. Jan van Eyck, whose Ghent altarpiece we looked at a few weeks ago, created this scene of the Annunciation, for the first time making it take place anachronistically in a church. This panel probably originally formed part of a triptych whose other two panels have been lost. Gabriel comes dressed in the liturgical garments of a priest celebrating a high mass with an elaborate cope or cloak over what is called a white dalmatic, which is a long sleeved sort of tunic. Mary is making a gesture with her hands which might be conveying surprise, but more likely is a priestly gesture, conventional at that time, and used at different points in the celebration of Mass. I will quote to you what art historians have said about this painting and Mary's gesture, which may be more than you ever wanted to know about this sort of thing, but bear with me. This painting has been connected with the Golden Mass, the Misa Aurea, a liturgical drama or dramatized mass popular in the Netherlands at the time, which included a staging of the Annunciation as the Gospel reading. More generally, this is part of a common theme in early Netherlandish art, where Mary, as intermediary between the faithful and God, is compared to or seen as a priest celebrating Mass, 
her personal sacrifice of her son is compared to the ritual sacrifice enacted by the priest in the Mass. End quote. So both Mary and Gabriel are seen as enacting a priestly drama of the Mass. You can see that Van Eck has printed in gold the words of Gabriel to Mary. Ave gratia plena. Hail, you who are full of grace. Mary's reply is printed upside down and reads, Ecce anchila domini. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Her reply is printed upside down to indicate that she is speaking to God above. Take a look at the wealth of details on the capitals of each column, each one different from the others, and all very, very complex. What Van Eck is conveying by depicting Mary and Gabriel in a church celebrating Mass is that the Old Testament is giving way to the new. If we look at the top of the painting, we see the central window with God the Father in the almond-shaped mandorla, and above him an image of angelic creatures with wheels, such as are described in the first chapter of Ezekiel, verses 15 to 21. On the left of this window is depicted Moses being saved from the waters and given to the daughter of Pharaoh, and on the right, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Above these images from the Old Testament, in this dark corner of the building, you can see that the planks of the roof are damaged and some are missing, as the old gives way to the new. Moving to the left, with light streaming through the windows, you see seven golden rays, and at the bottom, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. There are seven rays in keeping with the prophecy of Isaiah that the Savior to come will possess seven gifts of the Spirit, wisdom, understanding, wise counsel, power, knowledge, and reverence for and joy in the Lord. Above and next to the dove are two roundels, one an image of Isaiah who uttered this prophecy the other of Jacob, the founder of the people and the tribes of Israel, both vitally important Old Testament figures. Then if we move to the bottom of the painting and look at the tiles on the floor, we catch sight of the following Old Testament scenes. David slaying Goliath, which was seen as foretelling Christ slaying the powers of Satan, and Samson bringing down the temple on the heads of the gathered Philistines, another image of Christ defeating the powers of the evil one. To the right of these tiles, we have to admire the way that Van Eck has labored to accurately render the texture of wood and the sheen of silk on the stool at Mary's feet, and his careful depiction of the Madonna lilies symbolic of Mary's purity. The Bible Mary is reading is also captured in extreme detail, as is the jeweled bookmarker inserted in its pages. Above Mary's head are three carefully crafted, what are known as bullseye windows because of the shape of those glass inserts, fitted into three arches, all symbolizing the Trinity. It's almost impossible to take in all the glorious details of this painting. Just looking at Gabriel's elaborate cloak with its jewels and gold threads, his brightly colored wings with their peacock eyes, and his wonderful staff of rock crystal, it's all enough to make you feel overwhelmed. And that is what Van Eck set out to do blow you away with the intensely realistic and yet totally fantastic image of the moment when the Old Testament will give way to the new, the rule of law to the rule of grace. If you have the chance to go to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., be sure to look for this panel, 
which really is a wonder to behold. Roger Campin, otherwise known as the Master of Flemal, had just met Vanek in 1427, at about the time he created what is known as the Merod altarpiece. It is the crown jewel of the cloisters in New York, which forms part of the Metropolitan Museum. He was clearly influenced by Van Eck's style and use of oil paints, which he uses with great skill to agglomerate, again, an overwhelming number of details and symbols. I'm going to concentrate on the central panel, which concerns the Annunciation. The two side panels show the donors on the left, and an image of Joseph in his carpentry shop on the right. Now both are exquisitely rendered, but in the interest of not wandering too far from our subject, the Annunciation, this is the panel I'd like to focus your attention on. The minute you see it, you know that this artist is not concerned with capturing space realistically or with proper linear perspective. The room and the bench beside Mary telescope in a strange way toward the back, and the table where Mary sits at her devotional reading is oddly tilted forward so that the books, candlestick, and vase would be sliding right off onto the floor if this were a real space. Everything seems compressed and squeezed into place, as if Compin wanted to amass as many details as possible into his picture, everything rendered in painstaking detail. For both Compin and Van Eck, the construction of a realistic space was not important, but creating a very realistic rendering of the material world, which is to say wood, fabrics, metal, candles, flowers, glass, and so forth, that was of primary importance. You'll notice also that Flemish artists, unlike their Italian counterparts, were not interested in the human anatomy. The dissections of bodies and the careful depiction of human muscles, bones, and sinews that was so dear to Leonardo and Michelangelo, for example, was of no significance to the artists of the Northern School. You can't quite imagine what the bodies of Mary or Gabriel look like under their heavy draping in fabric, because that didn't seem as important to the northern painters as mastering the appearance of everything else surrounding the bodies, and everything you see that is so precisely and realistically painted also has a symbolic value, a spiritual message, as the nor uh, northern artists felt that the material world was charged with divine significance which is one of the defining characteristics of the Northern School. And what scene could contain more divine significance than the moment of the Annunciation? What Compin has actually given us is the second before Gabriel makes his appearance to Mary. She has not yet realized that he has entered the room. If we take a look at the upper left corner of the panel, we see the seven golden rays of the Holy Spirit that we mentioned earlier streaming through the window, signifying the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which will be Christ's. Wisdom, understanding, good counsel, power, knowledge, reverence, and joy in the Lord. Streaming along with the rays of the Spirit is the unexpected tiny figure of a baby, the Christ child bearing his cross. This is highly unusual. I've never seen this done by any other artist. Countless times you see the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, but this is entirely original to Robert Compin. Moving to the right of this, we see a precise rendering of elements needed for ritual washing, such as are used when the sacrament is being prepared during a mass. The metal pot, technically called a laver, as well as the cloth hanging next to it, are used to perform ritual ablution, and together with the lily, also symbolize Mary's purity. 
in the center of the picture, we focus on the three flowers of that lily, which once again reminds us of the Trinity. The vase is of a type commonly used in the Netherlands at this time, with this very kind of glazing and decoration. The devotional reading material we see so precisely depicted speaks to the movement from the world of the Old Testament that is indicated by the scroll which dangles off the table to the New Testament conveyed by the open book. The candle, which is in the exact center of the panel, has just been snuffed out. The smoke rising from the wick is perfectly captured, and the apparent significance is that the spirit of the Son of God has just entered our human world, taking on flesh and temporarily surrendering his exclusively divine nature. On the right, I suspect that the lions, which serve as finials on the ends of the bench, are to remind us that the child to be born will be the lion of the tribe of Judah, foretold long ago in the book of Genesis, and then mentioned again in the book of Revelation none other than Jesus himself. Scholars continue to debate the significance of other objects in the painting. We may never know what the candlesticks above the fireplace might have signified at the time this painting was created, or who the two figures are who appear carved on the columns on either side of the fireplace. Suffice it to say that these objects surely are not just decorative, because virtually every detail you see in a panel such as this had a spiritual meaning to, to the contemporary viewers. I hope this comparison of the characteristics of the Italian and Northern schools will help you to understand and decode the images of the Annunciation that you'll see on Christmas cards and in the media throughout the Christmas season. More importantly, I hope the images we've looked at helped you to ponder anew the mystery and paradox of this pivotal moment in history when the divine became human and the immortal came to dwell in perishing human flesh. I'll be taking a break from the art of the matter for a few weeks during Christmas and the New Year, so I'd like to wish you all every blessing and all the joys of Christmas, and a New Year that brings us more together than apart, and sees us freed from the fear and dread of a virus that has brought so much stress and heartache to so many. May Christ dwell in your hearts richly. I'll quote from the third verse of the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, in closing. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Merry Christmas, everyone.